Hello and welcome to Sunday Bible Chat for the second Sunday of Lent, which happens to be um, March 17th, which happens to be St. Patrick's Day. And so for all of you who are Irish or would be Irish, um, happy St. Paddy's Day. Uh, but Lent is going to predominate, I'm afraid, in my reflection. This isn't going to be about shamrocks and leprechauns or uh, Irish whiskey or any of the above, but rather um, a focus on how it is we can become the Christ, how it is we can become a new creation. And I thought I would just focus on a couple of the commandments um, just to see how limited our imaginations are when it comes to sin. We might pride ourselves, for example, on thinking that we observe the commandments. I mean, how many of us actually have created idols to go against commandment number one? Thou shalt have no gods before me. Or how many of us um, will uh, fess up to having murdered somebody, uh, commandment number five. Probably very few readers of Sunday Bible Chat have ever consciously killed somebody, though perhaps, um, you know, somebody may have had a car accident or something else which had tragic consequences. But for the most part, we probably pride ourselves in being, for the, you know, fairly uh, observant of the commandments. But that shows a limited kind of thinking. So um, let me just focus on commandment number one. You know, you should have no gods before me. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, etc. And you shall have no gods before me. You shall not make anything, any craven images, uh, etc. and worship them. Well, um, again, we, we have not made golden calves, most of us. But perhaps we have uh, lived vicariously through celebrities and failed to live our own lives. Or perhaps we have become unduly attached to technology. It may be that we spend hours uh, with our different gadgets, whether it's a cell phone or a computer, whether it's shopping online or playing video games, it's easy to displace God. And so even though on a literal level we might not have made some craven image, it may be that God is not first and foremost in our, um, in our priorities and that we have instead invested in uh, technology or in relationships. It may be that some other person is the object of our um, excessive attachment. And so becoming excessively attached to another being, whether it's a partner, a parent, a child, um, whatever the relationship, it could be a friend, um, that attachment can displace God's place in the center of self. So if on a literal level we have not made golden calves, um, still this is a very easy commandment to break if we have given undue status or attention to um, something or someone or some cause or some goal or even to work. So in a way workaholism is a displacement of God. Um, even um, you know, good things, cre the creative process can displace God. So if we become so absorbed in activities or so absorbed in, um, you know, again, in a relationship, you know, whether it's doting on a grandchild or whether it's um, you know, living only for one's significant other or whether it's um, never leaving the nest and investing totally in one's parents, whatever, whatever the case may be, we can be uh, breaking that commandment to place God first because of our attachments. So before we pride ourselves on not having broken this commandment, let's look at what we hold most precious in life. And one way of doing this that I've sometimes done in retreats when I've given group retreats is to have um, the participants draw circles of importance. So, for example, you have all these concentric circles what occupies the very, very central circle, the tiniest circle in the very middle of your concentric circles, what is there? Is it God? Is it things of the spirit? Or is it created matter? Is it music? Is it art? Is it sports? Is it celebrities? Is it television? Is it reading? Is it study? Is it um, volunteering? Is it God? Uh, next, uh, um, in, the, in the terms of circles, is usually family. So if we envision, envision a series of circles with God at the center, and then there are 
other circles around that, we can see where we have our priorities. If what's at the center, what's in the next circle, and as we progress to the outer circle, what occupies us or preoccupies us in those various circles? How do we rate our involvement, our attachment to other people, things, causes, and all of the above? Because if we can see our attachments in terms of some kind of a graphic, we can then um, have a sense of, all right, where is God in the wheel of life? Where is God in relationship to people, things, etc. Um, and so before then we, we say, oh, I've never broken the first commandment. Uh, let's look at our attachments and perhaps we'll find a bit of a shock that somebody or something or some cause has in effect um, pushed God out of the way and taken over. Um, another commandment I thought I'd look at is um, the third commandment about keeping holy the Sabbath. Now, we live in a world in which it's very difficult and almost impractical to dedicate one day a week totally to, uh, to things of the Spirit. Um, it was much, much easier decades ago before shops were open on Sundays or people went to work on Sundays at one time, at one time, um, one didn't work on a Sunday. In fact, if one did, it was sort of frowned upon. Um, but today we know that people's work schedules put them in the workplace. Uh, I, as a teacher, often have papers to grade on a, on a Sunday, or an article to write, or even Bible talk gets written on Sundays. Or um, it could be I have a presentation to put together, or I'm working on a wedding script of some kind for a couple that I'm going to officiate at their wedding. So basically, um, you know, Sundays are a difficult day to keep entirely free from work. Now, in the Jewish community, of course, the Shabbat, or the, the holy day from uh, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, um, if one is, um, you know, orthodox or if one's practicing um, quite rigidly, then no work of any kind gets done in that time frame. And that includes lighting the oven, putting on the electric lights, um, driving a car beyond a certain amount of distance unless there's a, a medical emergency. Um, so you might see lots of uh, people in the Jewish community actually walking everywhere on Shabbat. Uh, see, if you go into a Jewish neighborhood, you'll see people walking because driving is frowned upon. Um, moreover, in some households, um, any cooking is done ahead of time and sometimes um, a Christian neighbor ends up lighting the stove so the Jewish family can, can have their food. Um, phone calls are limited to social calls. There are no work um, calls that are made. So the third commandment is interpreted very strictly within the Jewish community. Um, for those of us who are not Jewish, uh, what can we do about this? Many years ago, I did practice keeping Sunday in that way. I mean, I did turn on my own lights and light the stove. I didn't go that far, but I did practice um, not doing any work, not grading papers. And I have to say that it was um, very freeing and very liberating to have that empty time. Sundays no longer work for me in that way. Uh, Monday, Sunday mornings are taken up with uh, church activities. But then um, I, take, I take time out on a daily basis or time out um, on another day when I can have my Shabbat time. It doesn't have to be on Sunday. So I think the important thing for keeping this commandment is not literally having a day a week where we spend the whole day in prayer or you know, just being quiet and silent, but we need to have in our lives the presence of silence, the presence of prayer, the presence of reflection, and the presence of um, family members and friends, because part of Shabbat is, is not just relationship with God, but it's relationship with family and friends. And so the idea is you free up your schedule, you free up your time to make, make time available for the loved ones in your life. So um, that might be a very important Lenten discipline for us um, to make sure that we are um, making time on a daily basis or on a weekly basis for prayer. And I'm, when I say prayer, I'm not talking about saying prayers. And this is subject for another, another conversation. But sometimes people mistake prayer time as sitting down and saying prayers by rote. And I don't believe that's what Shabbat is all about. 
So prayer is not about saying prayers, but being in a state of prayer. It's about being available to God and also responding to God's availability. It's entering into the mystery of God's heart and allowing God to enter into our own mystery. And we can only do that in silence. And that is the only place where we can listen. It's the only place where we can um, articulate our deepest heart's desires. So prayer then, in the sense of keeping Shabbat, again, is not just about um, saying prayers or even about ritual prayer, but it's about that availability to God. And the final one that I'd like to look at, the final commandment, is uh, commandment number five, thou shalt not kill. And again, most readers or most um, viewers are going to say, well, I've never killed anyone. And well, uh, there are ways of killing and there are ways of killing. I know for myself that one thing I need to do is slow down behind the wheel, because although I haven't killed anyone yet, I do tend to run late quite often and I do tend to speed. And so uh, I'm on a, a path that is, that, is, um, that is a dangerous one that I do need to slow down as I'm driving. Uh, which perhaps means getting up earlier or it means um, you know <laughs> speeding up as I get ready to go to to teach um, but anyway I am aware of my my driving habits and there and the needs to be a change um, but there are other ways of of breaking this commandment as well and uh, I think of how sometimes we uh, we don't kill a person physically, but we can kill them emotionally and spiritually by controlling them, by manipulating them, by limiting them, by looking down on them, by overlooking them at the workplace, by um, shunning them. There are ways we can break someone's spirit. There are ways we can um, be very destructive in someone else's life. So killing is not just about a literal physical killing, it's about killing joy, it's about killing um, uh, an ambition, it's about killing hope, it's about killing dreams. And when we kill somebody else's dreams, um, we've more or less killed the person. Because if somebody cannot dream, that person really isn't alive. Um, on another note, in terms of the um, of thou shalt not kill, I think of the environment, and in fact my book um, preaching and teaching loud out of sea has an extensive examination of conscience where I invite people to look at all they are doing and not doing in terms of the environment. So when we pollute, we are killing. We are killing all life forms. We are killing ourselves, in fact. When we drop plastic bags in the water, when we toss a can into a pond or river, when we um, throw cigarette butts on, 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 the, on the street, or um, when we consume uh, without paying attention to how much we're consuming, whether it's um, things like paper or plastic or um, whatever else it is we're consuming, um, then we are, in a way, killing the environment. And so uh, climate change is something that we're all uh, participating in. And so rather than say, oh, I never kill, we need to ask ourselves, to what extent am I actually contributing to the death of the planet? To what extent am I contributing to the extinction of species? To what extent, by buying certain products, am I... Um, basically involved in the killing of people's way of life. So if we buy goods manufactured in sweatshops, if we buy chocolate that is not fair trade, um, I think about chocolate, especially with Easter in a few weeks, and many people will be buying Easter eggs and so forth, but it's something to keep aware of is that the chocolate industry is, is basically fueled by child slave labor. The children are sold into slavery to work in the cocoa fields. And um, without even the joy of tasting chocolate, they are there in the harsh weather conditions, picking chocolate, their growth stunted. They're not even in school, treated very, very inhumanely. And so if you're going to buy chocolate Easter eggs, please consider buying fair trade chocolate where the work conditions are verified by um, humanitarian organizations and they make sure that children are not employed as slaves. Um, again, other products that are produced by slave labor might surprise you. It's not just clothing manufactured in sweatshops, but the fishing industry, particularly the fishing industry from Thailand, where people are kept on boats as slaves. That's a form of servitude. And so when we buy shrimp, let's say from Thailand, we are participating in slave labor. 
So, um, and that's a form of killing. So before we pride ourselves on um, keeping the commandments, we need to go a bit more deeply into, into what it is we're actually doing and, and not doing, and whether our actions or non-actions are creating um, a better world or a worse world, you might say. So if we're going to become the Christ, if we're going to put on Christ, if we're going to become a new creation, we have to be a little bit more creative in the way we think about sin. And instead of just limiting ourselves to thinking, thou shalt not kill means don't murder anyone, um, let us think about other applications, other interpretations. Or if we're going to become the Christ, how can we deepen our prayer life so we really are living in union with God and not simply mouthing prayers and boring God by our dramatic monologues. I'm sure God gets bored quite often by the incessant prayers of, um, of petition and give me, give me, give me. And what God is longing for is the presence of the human heart, the human heart in which God longs to become a uh, resident so the human heart could actually function as a tabernacle, a holy of holies for the divine one who longs to be at one with us. Uh, I'm not going to go in the other t uh, the other <laughs> into the other um, commandments. There are ten altogether, as you know, and they would take a long time to uh, to wade through. But just as you think about how you keep the commandments or don't keep them, take each one one at a time and go through that commandment and see whether it is you are keeping the spirit of the commandments or whether you're just obeying them on a literal level. If you probe deeply, you might have a few shocks, as, as I have done in the past. Um, our challenge, of course, is not to focus on what sinners we are, but rather on how we can become that new creation, that uh, creation that lives in Christ, that creation that follows the example of the gospel Jesus, um, a creation that lives in love, a transfigured and transformed creation that certainly delights God and leaves God feeling well pleased in us. And so on this note, this is Sunday Bible Chat, checking out.